focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters Han Dan and Che Ji-hee. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. I have to say, uh, the past uh, 15 minutes or so before the show uh, has never been so busy uh, because <laughs> this is the wonders of news broadcasts, right? Just the uh, mm-hmm. latest updates coming in left and right. Always happens just 15 minutes before our news begins, right? Always. Always for some reason, right? Um, we were anticipating, even after the first delay, as you know, for our listeners out there, the Nudie Space Rocket, the first uh, fully homegrown space rocket for South Korea. This was, if everything went well, uh, if there was no poor weather conditions in the first place, uh, the launch was supposed to happen today at around 4 p.m. That, of course, was delayed. Uh, we got the news of that yesterday. Uh, the launch was supposed to happen tomorrow. And just re- uh, right before the program, we find out uh, after it was put upright, put on its launch pad, it's been delayed yet again. Tan, I know it's been very busy. You've been rushing to get the latest uh, updates on this. What do we know so far in the latest delay? You know, up until just about an hour ago, we thought everything was going smoothly, right? With the nudie standing fully upright on the launch pad. And all we had left was some final inspection on key parts, mm. including the nudie's avionics or electronics equipment for aerospace and space vehicles, as well as the range system and the tracking equipment. Uh, these kind of final inspections were set to be carried out this afternoon. And also an umbilical facility that supplies propellant, namely fuel and oxidizer, were to be connected to the pre- projectile uh, before the uh, Naru could be launched tomorrow. And authorities were expecting all of these procedures to be completed by 7 p.m. But just about 30 minutes ago, we heard a a big shocking news. Unfortunately, the Korea Air Aerospace Research Institute has found an abnormal level of number on a sensor located inside an oxidizer tank. And so they said it is now impossible to proceed with remaining rocket launch preparation procedures. Now, they said it's difficult to check and dissect the exact problem, the exact cause Mm. of the problem, having the rocket standing upright on the launch pad So they said they would have to move it back to the assembly building to find out the exact cause. So it's set to be moved back to the assembly building in Gohung of uh, South Chola province. And authorities say it remains uncertain when uh, the launch preparations could resume. So definitely we will not see duty uh, lifting off tomorrow. Yeah, I think this is a uh, much bigger problem than just uh, weather conditions, right? Uh, Again, I I think just weather-wise, I was saying just yesterday, on our program, this is the first time in my life that I've been looking at weather conditions at Kohung uh, on mm. our you know search <laughs> engine, and then it looked like it was going to be perfect weather for a launch. But it's stuff like this, and it's not something that's probably going to be uh, done and over with and finalized within like the you know next one or two days. Right. Uh, this could take a while, right. uh, considering the fact that, like you said, uh, the rocket itself has been moved to the, uh, the assembly building once again. So they're going to break it down and once again, uh, tear it apart and see what's going on here. And there's really zero room for little room for any kind of error when it comes to a massive project like this. But just kind of a recap of everything that's happened. As you know, uh, we've been following this extensively since the first attempt back in October last year. We still remember kind of outside the studio watching this uh, very launch of uh, duty the first time around. It was, again, I hate to use the word fail because it was mostly successful, I Mm -hmm. think. You know, it hit that target altitude of 700 kilometers. But the only thing that went wrong is actually putting that dummy satellite into orbit. Tan, we know that there is a pretty big difference with the first launch and the second launch. So let's remind us once again, what are authorities saying that's uh, different this time around? Well, like you mentioned, the third stage was the problem last time uh, as a third stage engine burned out earlier than expected during the Nudie's first attempt that we saw uh, last October. So science Scientists and engineers have strived to improve the durability of the third stage engine, and they plan to send a functioning satellite designed to communicate with the ground control when they launch uh, Duty. And unlike last time, Duty will be loaded with a 180 kilogram performance verification satellite to test the rocket's capabilities and four cube satellites. South Korea has invested nearly two trillion won in building Duty, the development of which began 12 years ago. It began 
began in 2010. And the project was carried out using domestically developed technology across all levels from design, production and testing to launch operation. Now, this won't be the last attempt, though. Uh, I'm not sure when the preparations would resume. I'm not sure when it would lift off. But um, let's say that it fails this time around, too. I don't know what will happen. Right. Uh, I have no idea. No but one does. let's just say that if if it fails, we don't have to be frustrated, though, because no. it won't be the last time Korea plans to conduct four additional Nuri rocket launches by 2027 as part of efforts to further advance the country's space rocket program. And I've mentioned that uh, the Korea Air, uh, Aerospace Research Institute just about 30 minutes ago announced that they found an abnormal level of number mm-hmm. in a sensor located inside an oxidizer tank, right? I'm no expert. I'm no rocket scientist. So no. I have I don't really know what that means. We're still waiting for more details and uh, um, experts' explanation on what exactly that means. But I just to want to give it up for all the scientists and the engineers who may have burned midnight oil for weeks and yeah, for months yeah, and absolutely. for years to make this happen. We still have time and Korea still plans to, you know, keep going with the attempts to launch successfully until 2027. So I hope our citizens as well as all the researchers and scientists out there to not to be too much frustrated. You know, there's something about uh, space exploration, something about space uh, programs that really intrigues every one of us, even if we're not rocket scientists, even if we have no interest in, you know, space uh, exploration. But it is interesting. The thing is, you know, even, you know, fail or succeed with this uh, latest launch. I mean, like you said, I mean, they are going to continue this program until 2027. The only difference is, is that I believe after this launch, uh, if it's successful, the government, there won't be any government, uh, I guess, uh, it's not going to be run by the government anymore. It's right, going to be privately right, led. Right, right. So we have a number of other private companies, I believe uh, HANA Aer- Aerospace mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. another uh, a company that's been uh, heavily invested in the uh, the space program here. But I mean, little room for mistakes, which is why, I mean, delays like this, I, I think it's better off that they check off all the boxes before they launch off. But exactly. our thoughts and wishes regarding the Looney launch, I mean, we've been following this for, I mean, some quite time now. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's start off with you, Chihi. Well, first of all, I can't believe it's already been eight months yeah. since the <laughs> first the trial. Time, yeah. <laughs> time flies. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I still remember the time before our um, show. We were all out there in the studio watching that TV screen, mm, yeah. uh, hoping mm-hmm. it to succeed. But like you said, it wasn't, I don't think of it as a failure. It was uh, no. close to a success. And like Talon said, we still have a number of trials to go. Uh, so although it did not work this time again, uh, I don't think we should be disappointed. And I'm sure throughout the, through these uh, trials and errors, we will succeed in the end. And it's not something easy. And only seven countries in the world have succeeded mm. in this. And just by the fact that we have attempted it is a huge success itself, I believe. And in the near future, I'm sure we're going to succeed. And I hope that we do. Yeah, every little thing that we were able to accomplish in the first launch was a historic stepping stone towards, you know, completing you know South Korea's uh, space program, right? And one of the good things that I saw during uh, the first launch was that there was actually no one who said this was a failure. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no one that said anything negative about it. The only people that were actually really down were people at Kari, right? And, you know, they were disappointed it wasn't successful. But I think we, we have to applaud them for all the things that they've done. Tanya, yourself as well, I mean, your thoughts and wishes uh, for this uh, duty launch, unfortunately, which has been delayed. But again, it's going to happen one day or another. You know, first off, of course, it would have been better if everything went smoothly and uh, the new could have been lifted off tomorrow because um, all South Korean citizens were uh, very much anticipating for the liftoff. But I do want to mention how I had the privilege to um, interview one of the uh, the researchers at Korea Aerospace Research Institute. And I remember him telling me that at one point he couldn't even go back home for weeks so he wasn't even able to see his loved ones, his mm. family members for weeks, just stuck at his uh, research lab, I guess. And so I know how much effort and how much work they've put in, they've injected to get this far. You know, and I remember an article last time, last October, when the Nudi uh, gave its first attempt. A reporter wrote that Korea became the world's eighth country who has sent a projectile into the space until the third stage, Mm. the third 
stage, the third rocket stage. I don't mm-hmm. know how to say this. The third but, stage of the rocket, yeah. Right, right. And uh, it's really, I, I found it very um, nice and interesting how the reporter has put it that way, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. So I want to give a big round of applause for all the efforts uh, made by the scientists and the engineers to get this far. And like you mentioned, SJ, we still have the... Uh, the um, Korea's space program uh, in the near future will be led by the civil sector, yeah. and that could open up a whole new, a, lo- a whole new opportunity uh, for Korea's space program. So I'm not that much disappointed. I am very much looking forward to much more developments to come. We have to take into consideration South Korea's space program is very, very young. Mm-hmm. Okay, like mm-hmm. it's literally in the baby steps right now, and they've accomplished so much in their first launch. And uh, I mean, the second time around again, I think there was a lot of anticipation on the second one because we were able to figure out what went wrong with the first one. It wasn't going to happen again. Um, but yeah, I really have to give it to everyone who's been putting all, in all their efforts during this project. I had a chance to talk to one of the uh, Arirang uh, reporters who's down in Kohung. Mm. And I said, how is it down there? And he said, listen, um, I don't know how these scientists stay here throughout their entire time here because there's absolutely nothing. Mm. It's depressing here because it's, it's surrounded by basically nothing. Right. It's vast, just vast land and like ocean mm. there, right? So it's, it's like a mini island. And so, I mean, these people, like you said, they don't get to see their family members. They're focused on the work. We are really cheering on the second launch of Nudie for our listeners. We don't know when the second launch. There is no specified date. If we do get more information on this uh, delayed uh, second launch of the Nudie Space Rocket, we will get you guys uh, the updates on that front here. Uh, in the meantime, moving into our next piece of story, the South Korean Cargo Trucker Solidarity Union uh, will be, they actually ended their strike. They have returned to work as of Wednesday. They reached an agreement with the Transport Ministry uh, yesterday over wages and fuel costs. Chi, let's get the latest on this. Sure. So South Korean truck drivers returned to work starting today, ending an eight-day prote- protest after reaching an agreement with Seoul on minimum pay guarantees. So the week-long strike, which was called by truckers to protest over sharp rises in fuel prices, uh, has delayed cargo shipments for industries from autos to petrochemicals and spirits nationwide and cost the industry more than 1.5 trillion won, which is about 1.2 billion U.S. dollars, and unfilled deliveries, uh, according to the industry ministry. Now, average daily shipments of about 74,000 metric tons of petrochemical products have been slashed by 90 percent due to the strike, and about 5,400 vehicles were in lost production and high Jillo, uh, Jillo, which is the biggest brewer of soju in Korea, said its shipments were cut by about 40% by the strike. And also small business owners had voiced concern about the consequences of a prolonged strike uh, could have on the recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic. And at that latest round of talks, which happened yesterday, the Transport Ministry and the Truckers Union reached an agreement to uh, extend the truckers' minimum wage system and continue discussing expanding a guarantee of minimum and pay for carrying cargo to cover additional products. Now, the safe trucking freight rates system was due to expire later this year, but the two sides reportedly agreed to keep that in place. And this policy uh, was actually designed to help prevent dangerous driving by truckers and guarantee minimum freight rates. And the union said in a statement, uh, the Cargo Trucker Solidarity Union will immediately return to work and the Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport will make utmost efforts so truckers can return to work. And also in a separate statement, the Transport Ministry said it would work with Parliament to extend the minimum pay guarantee and review expanding fuel subsidies and support, quote-unquote, to ease truckers' difficulties from the recent rise in oil prices. And one of the union members said, all we're asking for is to remove the uncertainty in our lives. And the recent strike has indeed shown how a breakdown in one part of the distribution cycle can cause massive havoc and glad things turned out well with a reasonable agreement. Yeah, so, I mean, there's still things that need to be done with this uh, because what's interesting with the safe uh, trucking freight rate system is that, so like you said, it was supposed to expire this uh, this year, at the mm-hmm. end of this year, but the, the whole thing was extension of this. Although the strike has ended, what now they're discussing is 
what is an extension? Like, what, what, what is the terms of the extension? Are we talking about extension as in, are you going to extend it for another year? Or are you going to abolish the sunset provision as in, this is going to be basically set on stone that this is a new system in place and there's not no renewal on an annual basis. And so what the fear right now, because I mean, I don't know if the amount of the logistical disruption was at 1.23 billion US dollars in a single week mm. of the strike. So. The fear right now is uh, there might be another strike, but I mean, the PPP, they're going to be legislating an extension on the basic freight rate system for the truck drivers. I believe the opposition party, uh, they're looking for an abolishment of the sunset provision, which means you're basically going to be putting that on stone. No worries mm -hmm. of extension or anything like that. Good news is both sides are at least working, trying to resolve this very issue because yeah, it, with the fuel prices and everything, it really is unfair uh, for a lot of these truckers out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that we've been watching very closely uh, is, of course, the rate hikes uh, in the United States, uh, rising fears over a sharp U.S. Federal Reserve rate hikes. Continuing inflationary pressure have really further dragged down South Korea's benchmark Cosby to a fresh 19-month low. I actually did have a chance to look at some of the stock figures right before the show. It's actually devastating right now. So how did things look today? SJ South Korean stocks sank to a fresh 19-month low this afternoon, extending their losing streak on a seventh day ahead of the U.S. Fed's expected rate hike. The Fed will likely raise interest rates Wednesday local time, with investors dramatically raising their bets on a hike of 75 basis points, steeper than 50 basis points the Fed had promised. And against such backdrop, foreign investor sell-offs in shares traded on the main board Cosby and Junior Cost Act continued on this Wednesday, with Cosby losing 40 49.59 points to close at 2,447.38, while Kosdaq broke the 800 mark. The figure marks the lowest since November 2020, when Kospi closed at a little over 2,452. Foreign investors sold a net 454.42 billion won worth of shares, while individuals and institutions bought a net 346.28 billion won and 73.6 billion won worth of shares, respectively. The Kospi, which recorded an all-time high of over 3,300 in July last year, dropped sharply by over 25% to the 2,400 range. According to the Korea Exchange, as of today, the market caps of the Kospi and Kosdaq has evaporated by 276 trillion won and 93 trillion won, respectively, compared to the end of last year. So a total of 369 trillion won has vanished in just about six months. Now, shares of Samsung Electronics logged a new low of uh, 60,701, uh, with its market cap falling by 98 trillion won to 36.9 billion won. Shares of Naver and Kakao, two of Korea's leading growth stocks, were slashed by more than half. And all of this as foreigners continued their sell-offs to recover their investment funds. The net outflow of foreign funds reached 17 trillion won in Kospi and Kostak this year, driving the stock prices down. Now, some project the 2400 level to also break soon, with many experts predicting the sell-offs will continue for the time being. Yeah, I'm just looking at uh, all the figures. Uh, we did briefly talk about the uh, the South Korean stocks yesterday. It's all blue outside for some of the, uh, the companies out there. But uh, I mean, inflation, I mean, it's a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. People don't have the cash uh, to, you know, invest in all this. Uh, and so we're going to continue probably the, the consensus is going to continue to go on a, a downward trend here. Uh, in the meantime, some interesting news coming out today as well. Uh, the paid sick leave system, this is going to kick off early next month for a one year trial. Uh, in six areas across the nation. This is, of course, uh, in regards to infectious diseases like COVID-19. Uh, Ji, tell us a little bit more about this. Sure. So the country's interior minister, Lee Sung-min, announced today that a paid sick leave system guaranteeing 60% of the minimum wage as sick pay will go into effect starting July 4th. And the system will be tested in just six cities across the nation, including uh, the Jongno District in central Seoul and Pucheon, Cheonan, Suncheon, Pohang, as well as Changwon. Now, the sick pay trial, which will kick off early next month, will allow workers to take a leave for the prevention of infectious diseases 
and timely treatment. And according to a 2021 survey by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs, only 46% of employees said they take paid sick leave. And Minister Lee explained that in the wake of big waves of the infectious diseases such as COVID-19, it has become important to build a social condition where uh, workers can rest and recover if they're sick. Usually, like in Korea, the uh, common culture and norm is that you just still go to work even though you're sick. You know, that's like right. the common kind of custom. Right, as long as you, you don't faint mm. or anything, you still yeah. have to be at work. Yeah, mm. the only thing is with COVID-19, it's a little bit different, exactly. right? I just have to say, I have to thank Arirang for allowing me to work yeah. and get paid in full, uh, even <laughs> during my uh, COVID-19 situation uh, earlier this year. Speaking of which, let's take a look uh, very quickly at the uh, the COVID-19 situation here in the country. Normally, we don't really cover this too much on our focus on headlines uh, anymore, but gee, let's get the details. Right. So very briefly, the country's new COVID cases are now uh, c- continuing to show a downward trend, and it's remaining below the 10,000 mark for the sixth consecutive day today. So the exact, or, exact number is 9,435 infections, and this includes 104 cases cases from overseas. And what's notable here amid the downward trend is that the overseas infections increased to a three-digit figure for the first in about three months. And this is possibly attributable to the lifting of the self-quarantine period for visitors entering the country uh, starting on the 8th and the increase in the, in the number of inbound international flights. Now, the total caseload stands at 18,248,479, and the number of critically ill patients stands at 93, and the number of deaths from COVID-19 was 9. So the fatality rate stands unchanged at 0.13%. You know, I have to say, though, there there's just one figure that's a little bit concerning for me is we're seeing a rising number of cases from overseas mm. now. Um, mm. And the reason why that's concerning is because of the BA4 and the BA5s that could come in and that could uh, lead to reinfection numbers. Because I know in the United States right now and some other parts of Europe, they're seeing a big rise of reinfection numbers. Uh, as in even though they had Omicron, they're getting Omicron again through BA4 and BA5. But the good news is I, I had a chance to talk to a uh, a uh, health expert, but if you get reinfected, the symptoms are really, really mild. Uh, and so it's not a big deal, I guess, but uh, nevertheless. But it is concerning because remember the labor ministry just a few days ago announced that it will now, Korea will now open borders to migrant workers Mm -hmm. that were blocked from entering due to COVID-19. So we'll see like up to 70,000 foreign workers entering South Korea this year. So we're going to need some tight measures to make sure that um, there won't be too much of a spread from uh, imported cases. Yeah. And so, and and, you know, the other change that we've been seeing is uh, they're allowing uh, rapid antigen tests, right? instead of the mm. PCR, right? And so the other big question is whether or not these a- rapid antigen tests are enough to detect uh, some of these uh, new variants. But I think the consensus right now is just that, you know, milder symptoms, you know, we don't have to worry about it too much anymore. Mm. Um, and uh, how much longer can you go? You know, we can't be like China, like in, you saw in Beijing and Shanghai, if we see a like, s- slight spike, lock down everything again because it's going to disrupt the economy once mm, again. Right. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Though. Hopefully we won't see a massive resurgence once again. Uh, we're going to turn our focus to the latest on the diplomatic front this time amid rising speculation that North Korea's seventh nuclear test is imminent. Seoul and Washington uh, pushing for fresh sanctions against uh, Pyongyang. Tan, let's get the uh, latest details on this. Right. South Korea's foreign minister Park Jin, after his meeting with his U.S. counterpart Antony Blinken in Washington, said that Seoul and Washington are pushing for fresh U.N. Security Council sanctions against North Korea should Pyongyang go ahead with its feared nuclear test. And according to foreign ministry sources, South Korea is also considering to draw up unilateral sanctions against the North in addition to the fresh UNSC sanctions should there be another nuke test by North Korea. A high-ranking official at the ministry reportedly said that South Korea and the U.S. have agreed to review various steps and implement the unilateral sanctions when necessary. Now, talks of unilateral sanctions emerged after the U.S. failed to push through with its new Security Council resolution on North Korea last month at the UNSC, blocked by, of course, two permanent members of the Council, China and Russia. Now, if South Korea slaps unilateral sanctions against Pyongyang, it would 
would mark the first time since it blacklisted 20 North Korean entities and 12 individuals in 2017. And the U.S. is also mulling a secondary boycott on China if North Korea forges ahead with another nuke test in which organizations and individuals doing business with North Korea will be slapped with economic sanctions. In fact, according to the Voice of America, a U.S. senator during a government hearing has asked the Treasury Department to review sanctions against Chinese firms as part of fresh North Korea sanctions. The U.S. has imposed unilateral sanctions after North Korea's ballistic missile launches five times this year alone, but is yet to impose them on Chinese entities. South Korean officials believe that should North Korea stage additional provocation, especially a nuclear test, China and Russia will likely be left with not much grounds to oppose a fresh UN Security Council resolution. But at the same time, Seoul and Washington are continuing to uh, pressure China to play a more constructive role in taming North Korea. That's right. But what's interesting is uh, China is basically going, listen, Russia needs to do more uh, in regards to this. And Russia is going, China needs to do more. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to North Korea-related issues, but both of them are the ones that vetoed during the UNSC uh, resolution uh, hearing, right? Uh, in the meantime, South Korea and the United States have also agreed to further boosting uh, cooperation on global security issues. Uh, Tana, what is, issues are we talking about here? Well, as you may well know, the global economic security issues, including supply chains for key items now deemed vital for national security, like certain raw materials, semiconductors, and batteries. Second Vice Foreign Minister Lee Do-hun and his U.S. under and U.S. U.S. Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and Environment, Jose Fernandez, held their first in-person meeting in Toronto on Tuesday, where they vowed to take steps toward implementing agreements reached during the Yoon Biden summit last month. The talks took place on the sidelines of the inaugural gathering of the Minerals Security Partnership, which is a Washington-led initiative aimed at securing stable supply chains for critical minerals used in advanced technologies. All right. In the meantime, uh, Japan reported reported that the summit uh, between uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and uh, South Korean President Yoon suk are unlikely to take place on the sidelines of a NATO gathering in uh, Spain slated for later this month. Uh, President Yoon actually commented on the matter earlier today, so let's get the details of this, Chihi. Right, so Japan's Sankei Shimbun newspaper reported today citing multiple government officials that the South Korea-Japan summit on the sidelines of the NATO summit is not likely to take place. Uh, the newspaper explained that the conditions are not yet in place to hold a summit, with Seoul yet to provide a proposal on how to resolve the issue regarding the compensation for Koreans forced into labor for Japanese companies during the colonial rule, and a marine investigation being held around the Tokyo Island in the east coast of the country. Uh, they've been citing these two as uh, the conditions that are not yet favorable to Japan. And regarding this, a close aide of uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said, there still remain historical promises that South Korea has not kept yet, and there will be no circumstances in which Japan will proactively solve the matters. Uh, the media outlet added that the leaders of the two countries may meet for a short period of time or greet each other at least, but an official summit will not be prepared unless Seoul proposes ways to resolve the issues aforementioned. And meanwhile, President Yoon also said today that nothing has been finalized regarding a potential summit with the Japanese prime minister. And Yoon told reporters this morning, quote unquote, with diplomatic issues, it's a bit difficult for me to confirm anything before it's decided, but nothing has been finalized. Uh, and the president is set to travel to Madrid to attend a NATO summit on June 29th to the 30th, uh, which has led to speculation he could meet with Kishida on the sidelines. And if this is realized, the meeting would be the first summit between the two countries in over two years amid tensions over historical issues uh, stemming from the colonial rule. Moving on uh, to another piece of story here, uh, really sent shockwaves to a lot of fans. Uh, you know, when, one of the things when I do the news in the morning, at uh, Arirang News, uh, I always make sure if it's BTS related, I never mess up uh, because you go on YouTube and there's a lot of uh, BTS fans who watch it. Today, I had to be even more careful because I think there was going to be a lot of BTS fans who were a little bit worried. I think they were they thought maybe it was a breakup. We're talking about BTS. Uh, they're going to be taking a, a short hiatus is what they're hoping for. They're going to seek uh, solo careers to kind of explore individual growth. Um, some of the articles that came out, they said 
the group is splitting up, right? It, <laughs> not it, true. <laughs> not true. So it was a clickbait because technically they're splitting up to pursue individual careers before they come back. Right. But I think a lot of fans, they read that and, I mean, their heart stopped, right? Mm. So, Tana, let's get the details of this BTS news. Right. So in an emotional video appearance, BTS members said that they were taking a break from the supergroup to focus on their solo careers, citing exhaustion and the pressure of success. They unveiled this very surprising and shocking plan on a YouTube video posted yesterday evening of the group casually having dinner and drinks together to celebrate its ninth anniversary. It was a, a very candid session titled Jin Pang Tan Hesik, which can be loosely translated into the real BT after work get together, where the members shared their deepest thoughts heart to heart over a couple of drinks like soju, wine, and bakoli. I think this video already garnered like 15 million views already Jeez. after like 20 hours of. Of, of posting. Now, the boy band took its fans by surprise when the member stated they needed time apart. Suga said that, a quote unquote, we're going into an off phase now, with RM adding that they were exhausted and that they didn't know what kind of group that they were anymore. He confessed that it seems like the band has lost its direction. Oh, RM went on to say that the K-pop idol system does not give you time to mature. You don't have time to grow because you have to keep producing something. The group then said it'll focus on solo projects, which they have released in mixtape form so far. J-Hope is expected to be first in line to release his own solo album and seek individual career. RM said the group will begin dropping formal solo albums, starting with J-Hope's projects, although it may be too late to shed light on individuals' talent. Meanwhile, Jin expressed his interest in pursuing an acting career. He said, quote-unquote, I wanted to be an actor. After experiencing many things as an idol singer, I now think I don't have any feelings left for the job, but we never know what will happen in our lives. You know, sort of leaving the door open for the mm. possibility of launching his acting career. BTS is credited with uh, generating billions of dollars for the Korean economy, but very unfortunately, this share price of HYBE, the label of the seven-member band, went into a free fall after the announcement triggering more than two trillion won route as the shares plunged. And uh, a representative of Big Hit Music later clarified that BTS will start a new chapter in which they will simultaneously carry out team activities and individual activities and that this will be a time for each of the members to grow in their diverse activities and that it anticipates this will foster BTS into a long running team. Yeah, so this is not a breakup, right? right? I mean, right. you know, we we have a lot of these uh, groups pursue their solo pro In fact, right now Blackpink is doing just that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, J Jenny had their solo, I believe uh, Lisa had her solo, I think uh, Rose has her solo. And we also have what we call the unit group group in K-pop, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unique, they have that too. Um, but I mean, just uh, the impact of this announcement, I'm just looking at uh, Hype Entertainment uh, stock prices. It dropped almost 25%. Uh -huh. I'm sure it's new low, isn't it? It's a massive fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think it's, I've seen anything like this uh, since, uh, you know, the start of the, the, the stocks right. when, when they went IPO on this. But, you know, you can tell it, it's big news. Uh, but I'm starting to think maybe, right, that... You know, I believe, is it Jin? I think it's Jin is the oldest one on mm -hmm. the group. He's slated. I think he's military. scheduled to go to the military mm -hmm. by the end of this year, mm -hmm. I think. And so I think they kind of waited on whether or not they're going to get an exemption or not. Right. And oftentimes what happens is when so one of the members do go to the military, uh, they don't break up. They do individual projects. Right. And so this could be, I think this is a prelude to showing maybe BTS couldn't get the military exemption. Uh, that they, I, I don't think they were expecting it. They never said they expect this to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think this could be what it is right now. So we'll see. Again, I mean, the best of luck to BTS. I'm, I'm sure because they're so talented, uh, they'll be able to do. Uh, really succeed on individual levels as well. Uh, for our reporters today, Tan and Chi, thank you very much for coming in. Also, thank you very much for that last minute updates, right? It was such a <laughs> so hectic. hectic evening uh, yes. today, right before There's the show. There's actually one more. Yo, is it? A short, yes. Okay, I, I don't have the questions for that. I didn't know there were some updates. What's oh, the updates? Okay, okay. So, updates on just, it's just a brief reaction from the fans. Okay. Oh, we can't yes. miss that. We can't oh, yeah, miss no, that. Oh, yes. oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, although the boy band said um, they're not disbanding or taking a 
complete hiatus, but we'll be focusing more on solo projects this time. Uh, BTS's fans, collect- collectively known as ARMY, of course, express sadness and feelings of regret, but also uh, uh, messages of support as well. So social media was flooded with messages of support. They sent messages in different languages, including English, Chinese, and Spanish, saying that they knew this wasn't the end and that they'll continue to show support for the members' solo activities. Uh, And fans posted various messages, and one of them saying, I just want to give them a hug. Others saying, this is only the second chapter of BTS. And another writing, "Uh, I've anticipated this moment for a long time, but I didn't expect it to be today. And the name BTS will continue with ARMY like a tattoo that doesn't erase. (laughs) Yeah, and one one other fan described the move as being courageous uh, and that she had learned another important lesson from the band in which making a courageous move Mm. is needed in order to challenge yourself and uh, reach an upgraded version of yourself. Mm. Armies, they're so mature. They're a bunch of very mature and kind and warm-hearted people, Mm. right? True. I apologize to the Army for trying to silence you guys. (laughs) Uh, But... To, it's my bad. But you my, better watch out tonight. But I'm you better watch to, your back. I'm starting to think maybe Chihi is plotting to take my job because no, no. she literally gave me no question for this no. and made it Very look intentional, like... Very intentional, wasn't it? I think no, it was no. intentional that she made it out of all the things, out of all the questions that she could have left out. It was the one where it was about the comments of the fans. Watch uh, your back, SJ. <sighs> I'm trying to see what happens. All right, guys. Thank you very much once again for coming in. Stay safe. We'll see you guys again. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.